Good afternoon. Welcome back to those who were here yesterday, and welcome to those who are here today for the first time. My name is Brian Cuevas. I'm a professor in the religion department here at FSU. And uh, it's my pleasure once again to welcome you this afternoon to the second Tessa J. Bartholomew's lecture. And this is the final lecture in the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the religion department here at FSU. We're excited to have with us again today Professor Donald S. Lopez. And for those of you uh, joining us today for the first time, let me briefly introduce uh, Professor Lopez. He is the Arthur E. Link Distinguished University Professor of Buddhist and Tibetan Studies in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He's one of the most renowned scholars in the field of Buddhist studies and an amazingly prolific author. Yesterday, Professor Lopez treated us to a marvelous lecture, partly biographical, which traced some of the major shifts in the concept of Buddhism and Western scholarship. He focused particularly on the peculiar presuppositions and agendas behind the compilation and publication of the multiple and varied anthologies of Buddhist and Asian religious texts in translation. Uh, these anthologies that have appeared over several generations. Including uh, the more recent Religions in Practice series for Pr Princeton University Press, which Professor Lopez spearheaded and served as general editor. I mentioned yesterday that more recently, uh, Professor Lopez has been uh, training his eye on uh, the, remar the remarkable Tibetan language writings of an 18th century Italian Jesuit missionary to Tibet. His name is Ippolito Desideri. And this aspects of this work are the subject of Professor Lopez's lecture this afternoon, which is titled, Christian versus Buddhist, the battle for the soul of Tibet. This is a fitting subject for a stormy Good Friday. Right. So again, please join me in welcoming Professor Lopez. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for coming out on this rainy day. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. So conflict among religions is as old as religion itself, providing a central narrative in many sacred scriptures of the world's religions, even those as ancient as the Hebrew Bible and the Hindu Vedas. Much of human history is recounted in terms of re religious conflict, from the conquest of Canaan by the Israelites, to the conquest of India by the Aryans, the persecution of the Christians by Rome, the Crusades launched to reclaim the Holy Land, the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, the Turks at the gates of Vienna, the Mormons driven ever westward. The list goes on and on, extending to the present moment. It's only in the wake of all the bloodshed and destruction that historians have been able to determine that in almost every case, religion only provided a pretext, a rationalization, perhaps a irrationalization for, the far, for far less ethereal concerns than disagreements over the true nature of the deity. And it is in the wake of all the bloodshed and destruction that scholars of religion like Tessa Bartholomew's examine those texts that serve as pretext, those scriptures that condemn the infidel. And they've determined that these texts often tell us more about the condemner than the condemned, that the terms used to describe the other reveal much about the self. Any one of us can easily list the hyphenated pairs of adversarial adjectives Jewish Christian, Christian Muslim, Jewish Muslim, Hindu Muslim. Yet Buddhism does not immediately conjure such conflict. When Buddhist is connected by a hyphen to Christian, the first word that comes to the mind of most of us is dialogue. Why Buddhism, despite its antiquity and geographical expanse, 
has somehow been deemed exempt from perennial conflicts between religions is an important question, but a question for another day. This afternoon, I would like to consider a case of the negative representation of one religion by another involving a religion often considered immune from such negativity, Buddhism, and involving a region of the world often considered so pious and so isolated that it rose above such contention, both literally and figuratively, that country, of course, is Tibet. The author of this negative representation is a Roman Catholic missionary. How should we think about missionaries? When we visit the great churches of Rome, we find missionaries presented as great heroes. In the church of the Jesu in Rome, the Baroque tomb of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Society of Jesus, is flanked by two huge marble sculptures, the first entitled Religion Defeats Heresy, and the second Faith Defeats Idolatry. We recall that at the time of the great Roman Catholic mission to Asia, Africa, and the Americas, Europeans divided, believed that there were four religions, and four religions only, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and idolatry also called paganism. From the Christian perspective, the Jews and the Muslims had had their chance to embrace the true faith and had refused to do so. The idolaters were different. They had not heard the gospel and so provided a particularly fertile mission field. In the case of the Americas, however, it had first to be decided whether native peoples could understand the gospel, whether they were rational beings or natural slaves, a term from Aristotle to describe those humans whose bodies are to be used by others. It was only after the Valladolid debate of 1550 that it was considered, concluded that native peoples had souls that could be saved. When we, when we read the accounts of the Roman Catholic missions, we cannot help but be impressed by the determination and courage of these priests who undertook perilous journeys to unknown lands, braving all manner of danger and disease, learning difficult languages without the benefit of any of the tools that we require today. The annual reports they sent back to Rome called Relazione in Italian, were widely read, providing the basis for much knowledge of, the, of new worlds. And yet we know that the Roman Catholic missionaries were often soon followed by armies of conquest. By the late 19th century and the rise of the world religions discourse, European and American attitudes toward missionizing became more complex, even as churches, both Protestant and Catholic, across Europe and America, continued to ascend missionaries around the world. One's attitude toward missions derives largely from, from, from one's attitude towards idolatry. What we think of today as Buddhists were considered idolaters, a word that we, can sit, that we consider today as a term of abuse. And in some sense, what we think of today as the academic study of religion has over the past two centuries been devoted to the process of separating out various groups of these idolaters and giving them their own religions, each ending in the letters ISM, Hinduism, Sikhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Shintoism, Buddhism, and according to some, yet another idolatrous sect, Roman Catholicism. Thus Marco Polo, like the travelers who preceded him and followed him, never identified the religion he encountered with the name Buddhism, or some Chinese or Mongolian equivalent, or, or its priests as Buddhists. When he described Adam's Peak in Sri Lanka, he wrote, quote, and I tell you, they say that on this mountain is the sepulcher of Adam, our first parent, at least that is what the Saracens say. But the idolaters say it is the sepulcher of Sagamoni Borkan, before whose time there were no idols. They hold him to have been the best of men, a great saint in fact, according to their fashion, and the first in whom, whose name idols were made. Sagamoni Borkan is how you say Shakyamuni Buddha in Mongolian, the name of the Buddha that Marco Polo would have learned in the stately pleasure dome of Kublai Khan in Xanadu. When Buddha images, whether Buddha images are idols or whether Buddhists are therefore idolaters, again, is another question. Here we can only note that among the world religions, we somehow feel that missions to Buddhist lands are particularly inappropriate because Buddhism is just as good a religion as Christianity, if it is a religion at all. And this is not a recent conceit. We recall that in 1882, the Dutch biblical scholar Abraham Kuhnen argued that there were only two world religions, or what he called universal religions, Christianity and Buddhism. Given this, you might be surprised to know that among all the intrepid travelers to Tibet, perhaps none is more beloved among scholars of Tibetan Buddhism than a Roman Catholic missionary named Ippolito Desideri. He was born in the town, town of Pastoia in Tuscany in 1684, 
He entered the Jesuit order in 1700, studying at the Collegio Romano. Following two years as an instructor of theology, he requested permission to become a missionary. After audiences with Pope, Clem Pope Clement XI and Cosimo Medici III, he made his way to Genoa, where he sailed for India on November 23, 1712. Braving high seas and Turkish pirates, the ship made port five months later in Goa, the Portuguese colony on the west coast of India. Assigned to the Tibet mission, Desiderio traveled to Delhi, where he and another priest, the Portuguese Manuel Freire, set off on the trip north to Kashmir, then to Leh, in the capital of Dhaka, the westernmost Tibetan domain. They remained in Leh for 52 days. Desideri wished to found the mission there, but his fellow priest and superior insisted they continue eastward to Lhasa. They were able to survive a difficult seven-month journey thanks to the protection of a Mongolian princess who allowed the two priests to join her caravan. They reached Lhasa on March 18, 1716, a uh, tricentennial celebrated by a small but devoted Desideri fan club last week. After just a month in Lhasa, Desideri's companion decided to return to India, leaving Desideri alone, the only European and the only Christian in Tibet. Tibet was ruled at that time by a Mongol chieftain, the Latsang Khan, and Desideri was soon granted an audience. Apparently impressed by the Tuscan's determination to teach Tibetans the route to heaven, and his de declaration that he wished to remain in Tibet for the rest of his life, the Khan granted Desideri permission to stay, offering lodging and support. Desideri set to work studying the Tibetan language and the Tibetan religion. Less than a year later, on January 6, 1717, he presented the Khan with an exposition of Christianity written in Tibetan verse. It was not insubstantial, filling 128 short Tibetan pages. He called it Torang Munsyan Nima Charwe Da, the dawn, sign of the sun that dispels the darkness. The Khan, himself a Buddhist, proposed a debate between Desideri and a learned Tibetan monk but suggested that Desideri first undertake further study. He arranged for Desideri to live first at Ramoche, one of the oldest Buddhist temples in Lhasa, and then at Sarah, a monastery of some 5,500 monks on the outskirts of the city, one of the three seats of the Gelug order. His notes from his studies, preserved in the Jesuit archives in Rome, trace his course through a young monk's, young monk's textbooks and elementary logic through the masterworks of the tradition. Desideri's studies at Sarah were interrupted by war. A rival faction of Mongols invaded Lhasa in December 1717, assassinated the Latsang Khan, and pillaging the city. Desideri fled east to the smaller monastery of Dakbo. There he continued his studies until the Capuchins, who had arrived in the fall of 1716, finally received an official letter from the Propaganda Fide ordering Desideri and the Jesuits to leave Tibet. He reluctantly did so, Arriving in Kathmandu on January 20th, 1722, he would remain in India for five more years before departing for home. Desideri arrived back in Rome in the final stages of what is called the Rites Controversy. Jesuit missionaries to China, most notably Matteo Ricci, had adopted the forms of the local culture in order to proclaim the gospel, drawing a distinction between what, between what they called the religious and the civil. There was no question in their minds that Buddhism and Taoism were religions. They were, in their words, the sects of the idolaters and the sorcerers, and as such were condemned. However, the practice of ancestor worship was deemed by the Jesuits to be civil. And because it was not immoral or in conflict with Christianity, it was permitted among Chinese converts. Ancestor worship, as understood by the Jesuits, involved participation in seasonal ceremonies honoring Confucius, and the practice of bowing, lighting incense, and offering food at a funeral, at a grave, or at a family altar where stone tablets were arranged, each inscribed with the name of a departed ancestor and the characters, the seat of the spirit. Should Chinese converts to Christianity be permitted to make offerings at festivals honoring local gods, and could masses be said for the heathen ancestors of Christian converts? There was a range of opinion on these and related issues among the Jesuits, Positions became polarized when the Spanish Dominican Juan Batista de Morales left China and returned to Rome in 1643, condemning the Jesuit practice, calling it accommodation. Arguments circulated back and forth in China and in Rome throughout the remainder of the 17th century. On November 20th, 1704, the Holy Office issued a decree prohibiting the practice of Chinese ceremonies. 
papal bulls confirming the church's position against the practice of Chinese rites were issued by Clement XI in 1715. Desideri then returned to Rome in 1728. As a Jesuit, he was on the losing side of the rights controversy. His situation was made more difficult by the Capuchin charges that their failure to successfully evangelize Tibet was due to the errors of the Jesuits who preceded them there, and especially of Desideri himself. The last years of his life were consumed with composing long defenses of his work, as well as a remarkable account of his time in Tibet, the Notitiae Historiae del Tibet. He died in Rome on April 13, 1733. His works would remain unread and unknown for almost 200 years. Before Desideri left Tibet, he dispatched appeals to the Vatican, imploring the Holy Father to allow him to continue his work there. While he awaited a response that never arrived, he continued writing what he considered his most important work, a refutation composed in excellent Tibetan of the central Buddhist doctrines of rebirth and emptiness. Desideri carried this manuscript with him back to Rome, where it languished in the Jesuit archives read neither by the Tibetan audience for whom it was intended, nor by anyone else. The work is respectively entitled, Inquiry into the Doctrines of Previous Lives and of Emptiness Offered to the Scholars of Tibet by the Starhead Lama, Starhead was his term for Christian. It's a pun in Tibetan. Uh, the Starhead Lama called Ippolito. And for the sake of the Tibetan speakers in the audience, I'll give you the Tibetan name. Gogarki Lama, Lama Ippolito Shijawayi, Puwe Purki Keba Nama Gewa Namatam, Dombani La Dawe Gone Shua. Among Desideri's several Tibetan writings, those that he seems to have presented to or had, had intended for Tibetan readers were written in, the, in this standard Tibetan long xylograph form. Others were written in a, in, on long European style pages in a cursive Tibetan script. These were probably his own notes. The inquiry, as I will refer to it, likely the last text he was writing before he was forced to leave Tibet is different. At 464 large pages in codex form, it is by far his longest work. It's written in the capital or Uchen Tibetan script, likely in Desideri's own hand, and it's unfinished. Although the title promises refutations of the doctrines of rebirth and the doctrine of emptiness, his refutation of rebirth is far from complete, and he never gets to emptiness at all. It's an extraordinary text in many ways. First, it is the most sophisticated work ever written in the Tibetan language by a European. Second, it reveals a deep and nuanced understanding of Tibetan Buddhist doctrine and philosophy, one that would not be matched by European scholarship until the late 20th century. Third, it contains the most beautiful and beautifully crafted Tibetan poetry composed by a Westerner. The work begins with a long poem in praise of Jesus, written with such sensitivity to Buddhist metaphor that it could easily be mistaken as a hymn to the Buddha. Here's an excerpt. In order to arouse from sleep and dispel all darkness from all beings, forever be clouded by the gloomy darkness of delusion, sleepwalking mindlessly in their ignorance, you act as the sun whose light pervades everything. In order to compassionately search for, search for and lead those who blithely entered evil paths, wandering toward the abyss and toward danger, you lovingly appeared in the world, a single being who, without abandoning your indestructible nature, came to be united with the human nature. To those sunk in the mud of false religions, constantly indulging in misdeeds, to those bound in the prison of wrong views, you extend the hand of the peerless true religion in order to compassionately lead them out and untie them. You are forever free from fear, yet you know how to free others from fear. In order to cure those tormented by dangerous diseases incurable by others, negative deeds like desire and hatred, you became a physician for us common beings. You became a rain cloud of blessings, quelling the ever-burning flames of pride, jealousy, and lust, so difficult to douse. For those humans who do not, do not know, nor do they seek the source of refuge, you're like a mother because you give birth to all good deeds. You're like a wet nurse because you give the milk of virtue. You're a friend because you turn back all harm. Although this poem is in praise of Jesus, clearly the imagery is entirely Buddhist. The literal meaning of Buddha in Sanskrit is awakened, and the commentaries explain that the Buddha is so-called because he's awakened from the sleep of ignorance. The benighted sentient beings in the six realms of samsara are asleep, waiting to be roused by the Buddha. 
The Buddha has two bodies, the truth body or the Dharmakaya, and the form body or the Rupakaya. The truth body is a kind of cosmic principle of enlightenment, sometimes defined as the Buddha's eternal omniscience. The form body is the form of the Buddha that physically manifests in the world out of compassion for all sentient beings. The Buddha is often compared to a skilled physician, just as the best of doctors knows the appropriate remedy for the vast array of afflictions, so the Buddha uses his skillful methods to teach what is most appropriate for each person based on his or her own capacity and disposition. <clears throat> Elsewhere, his teaching is compared to the rain that nourishes all plants without discrimination, and he said to love each sentient being as a mother loves her only child. Thus, the Tibetan reader of Desideri's poem would read it as a paean to the Buddha. It is only at a few points in the poem that Desideri uses imagery that would be unfamiliar to the Buddhist, but immediately familiar to the Roman Catholic. For example, you are never tainted by impurity, we are ever stained by impurity. In order to free us from defilement, each day you transform your blood, endowed with the power to cleanse and completely dispel all impurity from every mind. Desideri's text is, for the most part, a philosophical refutation, not a polemic. He speaks directly to the scholars of Tibet in his terms, in their own language, and on their own terms. He regards Buddhist monks as learned and worthy interlocutors, and he sees in Tibetan Buddhism a commitment both to rational philosophy and to ethical practice. He thus discerns the possibility for reasoned argumentation on key points of doctrine. He also clearly feels that he will eventually win this argument and convert the Tibetan people to the truth of the gospel. To do so, he must first establish the value of studying another religion, even if one is committed to one's own. Here, Desideri seems to anticipate by 150 years Friedrich Max Müller's famous dictum of comparative religion, quote, he who knows one knows none. But Desideri uses the naturalistic imagery so common to Buddhist texts to make his point, and I quote, to encounter another tradition that accords greatly with one's own tradition and understand them both is like having two butter lamps burning in a single room, or one gold or, or silver ring shining with the light of two diamond studs. Again, if a tree receives the appropriate amount of water from separate sources, rainwater and water from a stream, its roots will go, grow large and the tree will be more and more firmly, fi firmly fixed in the earth. In the same way, by moistening one's mind with the complete instructions and essential points of one's own religion, as well as another religion that accords with it, one's body, speech, and mind will, not be, will become mo mo most conducive to religion and one will, like a thick nail, abide with a firm aspiration to religion. Acknowledging that someone might object that there is no reason to study another religion when one's own is clearly superior, he says that although iron and wood are clearly inferior to gold, they can be used to make a shovel with which to dig up more gold and make beautiful jewelry. Among the myriad doctrines of Tibetan Buddhism, Desideri chose only two to explore, the two which arguably stand at the very foundation of the Buddhist philosophical tradition, the doctrine of rebirth, and the doctrine of no self or emptiness. Unlike in China, the doctrine of emptiness <clears throat> was of paramount importance in Tibet, especially in the Geluk sect at whose monasteries Desideri studied. He recognized that the doctrine of rebirth and its attendant doctrine of karma presented two problems for the Christian faith, a challenge to the view of heaven and hell as the final domains of the blessed and the damned, and a challenge to the idea of a creator God who blesses and damns his creatures. The doctrine of emptiness is in some ways even more consequential for it entails the negation of a transcendent and pre-existent deity as well as the negation of a first cause. Desideri seems to believe that if he can undermine or even call into question the validity of these two doctrines, then his task of establishing the existence of a fundamental and eternal ground of all existence, that is the existence of God, becomes possible. Yet despite his final aim, Desideri's text is entirely Tibetan, in style, in concept, in terminology. He uses Buddhist terminology extensively and accurately, quoting from Buddhist scriptures to argue against Buddhist views. As, Des as Shakespeare reminds us, the devil can cite scripture for his purpose. And he presents his arguments in the classical form of Tibetan debate, one that he observed on the debating courtyards at Sarah outside Lhasa. <clears throat> 
It's clear from, his, from both his Tibetan and Italian writings that Desideri found great fault in the doctrine of karma. At first sight, this seems surprising. It is a system of ethics, in Buddhist terms, of what is to be adopted and what is to be discarded, that lists 10 sins, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, senseless speech, coveting, harmful intent, and wrong view. Depending on how one interprets the last item on the list, there seems to be nothing here at which the Christian to which the Christian cleric might object. And indeed, it does not appear that this is what is irksome to Desideri. Instead, what he finds abominable is that the virtues and sins performed in this world also bear their fruit in this world as, in all, ma in, as all manner of mundane pleasures and pains. That is, the Buddhists do not heed the Gospel of Matthew, where at, at chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, we read, Lay not up to yourselves treasures on earth, where the rust, the moth consume, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up to yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither the rust nor moth doth consume, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Desideri skillfully adopts a Buddhist vocabulary to say that the Buddhist system, by claiming that the pleasures of the mundane world are the result of virtuous actions done in the past, promotes attachment to those pleasures, which in fact are not pleasures, but are sources of terror. He declares that any Buddhist who analyzes this properly will say, I see that my own tradition has no, real, no salvation of any kind, and that it is impossible to eliminate the fault of squandering all perfect virtues. This will lead to a deep sense of sadness in the Buddhist, Desideri argues, who will then lament. Alas, although mired up to my head in a swamp of rotting corpses, a swamp that smells like excrement, I think that I live in a place where all precious things are gathered. What greater self-delusion and stupidity could there be? Desideri uses his Buddhist allusions well. One of the four neighboring hells in the standard cosmology is called Swamp of Corpses. Let us look briefly at some of Desideri's arguments against the Buddhist doctrine of rebirth, which presents profound problems for Christian doctrine. Desideri saw the system of rebirth as absurd, lacking Aristotle's unmoved mover and first cause. For Aquinas, the unmoved mover is God. Indeed, four of his five famous arguments for the existence of God rest on the conclusion that there must be a first cause. And in his essay on the eternity of the world, Aquinas specifically rejects the notion of something eternal that was not created by God. He writes, quote, if someone holds that something besides God could have always existed in the sense that there could be something always existing and yet not made by God, then we differ with him. Such an abominable error is contrary not only to the faith, but also to the teachings of the philosophers who confess and prove that everything that in any way exists cannot exist unless it, is, unless it is caused by him who supremely and most truly has existence. And of course, Buddhists hold that the cycle of rebirth is eternal and is not created by God. Buddhists therefore explicitly reject the idea of a God who is creator of the universe and of the creatures who inhabit it. They set forth instead a cycle of birth, death, and rebirth that has no beginning created only by the former deeds of the beings who inhabit the cycle, an infinite series of contingent causes producing continued effects as philosophically frustrating as such a doctrine might be. Perhaps one reason why the doctrine of rebirth is not set forth with the philosophical detail one finds, for example, in the doctrine of no self, is that the doctrine of rebirth, at least in general, appears to have been inherited by the Buddhists, with the important exception of the Lokayatas, the materialists, the competing philosophical schools mentioned in Indian Buddhist texts seem to uphold, or at least not reject, the doctrine of rebirth or reincarnation. Proofs of rebirth would only appear in later Indian Buddhist literature. The argument in brief is based on the strict Buddhist causal dualism of mind and body, according to which, although matter and mind can always serve as each other's so-called cooperative conditions, it's impossible for one to be the substantial cause of the other. Therefore, each moment of consciousness of any of the types of sentient beings, six types, is the product of the previous moment extending back in time to the moment of birth. And for womb-born beings, such as humans and animals, the moment of conception. Since the semen of the father and the blood, in Buddhist terms, of the mother are both matter, they cannot produce consciousness. The consciousness that enters 
The combined drop of semen and blood must therefore come from a previous moment of consciousness and hence from a previous lifetime. The process of rebirth in general has no beginning. Desideri presents many arguments against this, several of which play on the meaning of the te Tibetan word yewa, which can mean both birth and production, declaring that the notion of birth and the notion of prior existence, both of which the Buddhists seek to maintain, are incompatible. Drawing on the Buddhist theory of causation, Desideri argues that birth entails something that did not exist in the past coming into existence in the present. The Tibetan term is ngarme sargye, which means the new production of what did not exist in the past. Thus, it is illogical to hold that birth has no beginning, because birth is by definition the coming into existence of what did not exist before. Following the famous Madhyamaka strategy of using the opponent's own doctrines to demonstrate the fallacy of, of those doctrines, Desideri cites a famous passage from Chandrakirti <coughs> from the Madhyamaka one of the seminal five texts, the Shunga of the Giluk Academy. In this passage, Chandrakirti is criticizing the doctrine of self-production self in the Indian Sankhya school, according to which only something that, that already exists in the cause can be produced. And here is Chandrakirti's quote. If it originates from itself, it will have no benefit at all. Moreover, it is illogical for that which has already arisen to re-arise. If one conceived what has already arisen to rise once again, the arising of sprouts and so forth will never be obtained here, and the sea will continue to reproduce until the end of existence. In what way can the, can the sprout ever bring about the cessation of the seed? Thus, Desideri is arguing that if the Buddhists hold that rebirth has no beginning, then rebirth is preexistent. The logical fallacies that the Buddhists ascribe to the to Sankhya philosophy, one of their great opponents, historically, are equally present in their own. Much of Desideri's refutation of rebirth, therefore, centers on this issue of the uncaused cause. But it's also easy to discern Aquinas in other sections of the text. For example, in his refutation of emptiness, which is found in another work, we find the famous argument from degree, which states in brief that because there is a hierarchy of qualities, there must be something that has the highest of all qualities. As Aquinas writes, quote, more or less are terms spoken of various things as they approach in diverse ways something that is the greatest. So here is what the argument, argument from degree sounds like in Desideri's Tibetan translated into English. When a phenomenon that is not the most excellent appears as an object of the mind in terms of apprehending its qualities and apprehending its features, the mind involuntarily comes to imagine something else which is superior to such an object. Thus, when one experiences some pleasure that is not the most excellent and is not incomparably supreme, one, invol one involuntarily comes to imagine something else which is far superior to that. Therefore, the minds of the wise are involuntarily unsatisfied, knowing that what is established as the supreme, the best of the best, without compare, is something to be sought. The intelligent are involuntarily discon discontented, and through their awareness that, that which is established as supreme, the best of the best, without compare, is something to be sought, they assert that something that is supreme, the best of the best, without compare, can or cannot be found. If it is the latter, this is illogical, because it is illogical to assert that those whose minds are endowed with strong intelligence and strong will must be irreversibly and completely tormented by the invariable suffering of not finding what they seek. Therefore, one must accept that apart from all the things that are established by mere conventional knowledge, they are established as, that are established as emptiness and that arise in reliance and dependence on something some object that is superior to those and is intrinsically established is to be found. I noted above that Desideri's text is largely devoted to philosophical refutation, that he rarely resorts to polemic. However, at one point uh, in his refutation of rebirth, he sets aside the more traditional form of critical analysis with its dense labyrinth of syllogisms and resorts to a form of cultural imperialism uh, declaring that the Tibetans' belief in reincarnation cannot possibly be correct because no one else in the world believes it. It's an it is an eccentric view held by a tiny portion of the world's population. 
He begins uh, with a request from a hypothetical Tibetan described as an impartial and capable person, led and guided by the rope of various pure tenets and solid and irrefutable reasons, who is unclouded by the darkness of prejudice. This person states that, given the vastness of the world and variety of the peoples who inhabit it, it would be wrong to conclude that everyone in the world is incapable of distinguishing what is reasonable from what is unreasonable. He goes on to say that in some parts of the world, people tell stories about previous lives, and thus the belief in former lives becomes part of their religion. However, everywhere else in the world, people believe in the rewards of virtue without telling stories about past lives. Indeed, the belief in past lives and the claim that one can remember those lives are, quote, abodes of error and perversions of the perfect faith. This hypothetical Tibetan therefore appeals to the Christian priest, the so-called starhead lama, who has far more experience in the world, to, quote, act with kindness to all in the snowy land by clearing away all the stains of doubt and misconception and teaching the, the, teaching the articles of unmistakable faith. In response, Desideri embarks on something of a geography lesson, explaining that there are four continents, Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. Europe, in his words, is the main one and is wondrous. The religion there is, quote, the excellent religion of the starheads. Asia has five religions, that of the starheads, that of the Jews, that of the Muslims, that of the Acharyas, presumably Hinduism. Uh, the system of Tibet and China and Nepal, by which uh, Desideri likely means Buddhism, a term that would not be coined in Europe for another century. In Africa, some follow the religion of the starheads, some follow the tenets of the Muslims, but most people, he says, are pagans. Uh, here, Desideri uses the term mudekba, uh, tirtaka in Sanskrit, a term used in Buddhist texts to describe non-Buddhists, especially Hindus. In America, he tells us, quote, the excellent religion of the starheads is very widespread, but there are also some pagans. Desideri declares that nowhere in Europe, Africa, or America does anyone believe in the cycle of rebirth, and no one tells stories of past lives. Lying about how they, ha quote, lying about how they can remember and describe their earlier experiences as if they were coming here from other worlds. We might note here that in, in passing that Matteo Ricci had made a similar argument against rebirth more than a century earlier in his true meaning of the Lord of Heaven, the Chen Shu Shuri uh, that he wrote in Chinese. There, Ricci notes that someone who had lived a previous life should be able to remember it, but Ricci reports that he's never met anyone who actually does. When his Christian interlocutor objects that there are many stories in Taoist and Buddhist texts of those who do remember, Ricci dismisses this as the work of the devil and note that it, that, is, that it is significant that such claims only occur in Buddhist countries. In other countries, from ancient times to the present, there have been great sages who have been able to memorize thousands of books, but none of them can remember a single event from a previous life. He goes on to argue that if one cannot remember one's previous existence as an animal, why would the Lord of Heaven have created reincarnation as a means of discouraging sin? Elsewhere in the text, uh, arguing against vegetarianism, he says that uh, if God did not want us to eat meat, uh, why did he make it taste so good? <laughs> this is uh, something I call the vegan's koan. Um, so. uh, despite the similarity of the arguments, there's no evidence, by the way, that Desideri knew of, of Ricci's argument. So Desideri goes on to explain to his Tibetan audience that the peoples of the, of, of the other continents have a completely different view of the pleasures and sufferings of the world. The Buddhists believe that the pleasures of the world are the result of virtues performed in the past, and that the sufferings of the world are the result of non-virtues. However, everyone else in the world believes that the pleasures of the world are causes of suffering to be renounced, and the sufferings of the world are opportunities for goodness and are therefore to be welcomed. Furthermore, they believe that when one dies, one goes to the next world never to return and that the next world is eternal, unlike the heavens and hells of the Buddhists. Thus, and I quote Desideri, the inconceivable number of persons who follow the three religions of the starheads, the Jews, and the Muslims, and who live in or rule the many lands and islands of this part called Asia, do not agree with each other, 
on a great many articles of faith. Nonetheless, understanding that the pleasures and sufferings of this world, of the living, are the causes of virtue and non-virtue, and that it is untenable that they be effects of, of virtue and non-virtue, they hold that wandering in samsara is a misconception of childish common beings disturbed by the sleep of ignorance and is a perversion of the perfect faith. If the Tibetans believe that those who perform acts of virtue are reborn as humans in Tibet and tell stories of their past lives, then they must believe that those who perform acts of virtue are also born as humans in other lands. Yet no one born as a human in other lands tells stories of their past lives. It's therefore untenable that Tibetans do so. The memory of former lives is therefore contradicted by logic, despite the accounts of those lives being heard by a conventional sense consciousness in Buddhist terminology. The scriptures that assert that one is born as a human as a result of deeds of perfect virtue and assert that those who are reborn as humans remember their past lives are, quote, polluted by external and internal causes of error and are established as having the quality of being unworthy of trust, like the collapsed relying upon the collapsed. Desideri concludes this section with a poem of his own composition, and it ends with an exhortation paraphrasing Shantideva, quote, do not sleep at the time of learning, dispel the darkness of ignorance. So what are we supposed to do with Desideri? For so many of the Roman Catholic reputations of Buddhism, including those by such famous figures as Matteo Ricci, the scholar of Buddhism regards their portrayal of Buddhist doctrine as a crude caricature. The particular doctrine to which they refer is sometimes recognizable, albeit in garbled form, sometimes not. Those caricatures are worthy of study, but they are not philosophically compelling. Tezideri, however, is a different case. He speaks the idiom of Buddhist di of dialectics fluently. He knows the vocabulary, he uses it properly, he knows the text, he knows the rhetorical conventions, he gets rebirth and emptiness right, he argues that they are both wrong. <clears throat> Beyond praising him for these skills, does anything follow from that? Or are the underlying assumptions of Buddhist and Catholic scholastics so different that despite apparent translatability, they remain ships passing in the night? Is there any acceptable response that is a response acceptable to the Christian that a Buddhist scholastic might make to the claim that all philosophers, in the words of Aquinas, quote, confess and prove that everything that in any way exists cannot exist unless it's caused by him who supremely and most truly has existence. Is there an acceptable response that is a response acceptable to the Buddhist that the Christian might make to the Buddhist famous refusal to answer the question, is the, word, is the world eternal? One might be tempted at this point to say that theology is nothing more than the intellectual arti articulation of visceral belief. As Pascal famously said, kneel down and you will believe. But this is Pascal as quoted by Slavoj Žižek. The longer passage is kneel down, move your lips in prayer and you will believe. But this is Pascal as quoted by Louis Althusser. Pascal never said either of those things. Not unlike the missionaries' garbled versions of Buddhist doctrine, this is a garbled version of Pensée 944, which makes a more subtle and more sophisticated point. Quote, the external must be joined to the internal to attain anything from God. That is to say, we must kneel, pray with the lips, in order that proud man who would not submit himself to God may be now subject to the creature. To expect help from those externals is superstition. To refuse them to the internal is pride. Thank you very much. <laughs>